Thank you. Good evening. I am Minnie Lau, um, uh, the host of tonight. Uh, good evening, Singapore. Good evening too, to our viewers across the globe. Uh, my our apologies for the late broadcast due to some technical issues. As you know, these things happen. So apologies for that. And now we are going ahead and proceed. So good evening, Paul. Good evening again. I am Minnie Lau, treasurer of the Philippine Bainian Society Singapore, and your moderator, co-moderator for tonight. Join me as we discuss the future of the built environment with our architect Theodore Chan of um, CIAP Architects. But before we call on our distinguished guest speaker, allow us to share with you who we are and what we do. The Bainihan, Philippine Bainihan Society Singapore was officially inaugurated in August 2001. It is managed by a board of directors led by our Emeritus President Jenny Chua and Honorary President Ranveer Kumar Singh, and all are volunteers. We are housed at the Bainihan Center, a four-story building located at 43 Pasir Panjang Road, just opposite the Maple Tree Business Center and a walking distance from Labrador Park, MRT. The Bainian Society is a recognized volunteer welfare organization and a member of the National Council of Social Services, NCFS, in Singapore. Our main objective is to promote advancement of education and skills and to provide a venue for the conduct of education, training, and personal development programs for Filipinos in Singapore. Bayanihan Center is the home to Filipino overseas workers in Singapore, FAUS, which offers courses such as nursing aid, basic and advanced baking, hotel restaurant management, caregiving courses, and many others. And the center is also home to Ateneo LSE program or leadership and social entrepreneurship program. It is also home to Bayanihan Talks, which we are doing right now. This is part of our Bayanihan Talk series, which has been organized since September 2018. Topics included an understanding series on OFW's benefits of membership in SSS and PAGIVI, as well as we had talks on financial literacy and also on cultural discussion. The center also has, a meet, has meeting rooms, a tambayan room, letter boxes, and a professionally designed photo studio that are available to Filipino organizations in Singapore and to the OFWs. We are also the team behind the annual Bayanihan Walk, which started in 2015, and the annual Bayanihan Lecture, which was launched in August 2019. So I hope everyone now has a better understanding of what we are and what we do. Please do approach us for any training or skill ideas or cultural activities suggestion. Do contact our Bayanihan Center officers, Cecil and Mindy, for any inquiry. And now, I'd like to call on Attorney Ranveer Kumar Singh to say some rem opening remarks. Attorney Ranveer, please. Thank you, Mini. Good evening, everyone. And welcome again to the Bayanihan talk this evening. As we have heard from many, this Bainihan talk series has been organized by the Philippine Bainihan Society. And Mini has given you an, an outline of what we are and what we do. Just to add on a couple of points on who we are, we are basically a symbol of cooperation with the government of Philippines and the government of Singapore. So we are a non-governmental organization we are dedicated to the upliftment of the Filipino community in Singapore. And how we do that, as many as I show you some slides, we have a lot, a uh, wide range of activities, and principally is involved in the training and upskilling of the Filipino community in Singapore. We are also open to the other segments of the community in Singapore. Over and above training and uplifting programs, we also hold cultural and social activities. Now, we work along very closely with the Embassy of the Philippines in Singapore. Uh, our very existence is due to the Embassy of the Philippines. 
we work along with all the major income groups in Singapore so that we galvanize the efforts of the entire community, all the, all the major Philcom groups, and so we can reach out to as much people as possible. We are constantly looking to include everyone. Everyone is uh, welcome to join our activities, and uh, you are allowed to also use our platform for the activities. Now, the Bainihan Talk series, as many has said, started about two years ago. Initially, it started off on a quarterly basis. As a result of the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic early this year, we had to uh, then reach out in a different way because we had to scale down on our in-person meetings. The only way to reach out to our audience and to our constituents was virtually. And that, uh, and, and this enhanced the virtual Bainihan, the webinar series, started in June this year, and we were encouraged by the tremendous response that we received. More close to about 10,000 people had logged in into our first, the very first Bainihan talk in June. And that prompted us to increase the frequency of our Bainihan talks from, from one in a, once in a quarter to once in a fortnight. Now, so since June, and now in September, we have got several Bainian talks which have been, uh, uh, which have been held. And on every fortnight, we have covered a very wide range of issues. We've been encouraged by speakers who have come from far and wide, from our uh, members of the Philcom group, our supporters and our well wishers. And we are encouraged you to also come and use this platform to give a talk on matters which may, which may be of interest to the Filipino community at large. Now today, we are indeed fortunate to have one of our board members, Mr. Thuro Chan, who is an architect of profession, to talk on a very topical matter which deals with the environment. It's called Future of the Built, and I'm sure you will, you will, you will learn quite a bit from him on such a topical interest. With that short opening remarks, I turn you over to Theodore Chan. I hope you will enjoy this talk and feel free to post questions during the Q&A session. Thank you and have a fruitful evening. Thank you. Thank you, Tony Ranveer. Yes, tonight we have um, a famed architect, but before that, to introduce our guest speaker, we also have a guest uh, moderator. Um, let me call upon Mark Lester uh, to introduce our guest speaker. Mark is the president of UAP Singapore chapter. Mark, please. Hi, good evening to all. Uh, I would like to introduce our guest speaker. He's architect Theodore E.C. Chan, FSIA, PPSIA, director of CIAP Architects PPE LTD Singapore, and the immediate past president of Singapore Institute of Architects. Architect Theodore Chan is a director of CIAP Architects. As the architect and director of CIAP Architects, he played an instrumental role in the design and implementation of several award-winning healthcare projects, Mount Elizabeth Novena Hospital, NUHS Medical Center, and Yishun Community Center. In 2019, he was conferred the title of Green Architect 2019 jointly by Singapore Green Building Council and Building Construction Authority. Prior to joining CIAP Architects, he had 29 years of experience in multiple architectural firms, IVS, Richard Jim Architects, Tanguan, Tanguan D Architects, and SAA Partnership Architects. He was directly involved in significant projects which included the Picture House, Bungalow Houses at Mount Batten Road, World Trade Center Harbor Pavilion, Hotel Rendezvous, and Jalan Besar Stadium. Mr. Chan served as president of Singapore Institute of Architects from 2012 and 2015, where he developed the curriculum for the architecture practice course and the national competency standards for architecture practice. He has also served as the several key industry panels, Board of Architects, BCA Green Buildings, Master Plan, and Productivity Advisory Committee, URA Conservation Advisory and Committee, 
People's Association Development Committee and the LTA MRT Development Architecture Design Review Panel. From 2004 to 2008, he taught as adjunct architecture studio master of the Department of Direct Architecture, School of Design and Environment of NUS. He has also served as guest critic at Department of Ar Architecture and Architectural Sustainable Design Pillar. Let's all welcome Architect Theodore Easy Chan, our guest speaker for tonight. Uh, you have to let me share the screen. Uh, who's controlling the screen? I have to share my slides. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I like to keep this, this talk very informal because um, it, it's, 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 it's an evening and everybody is <laughs> very tired, I'm sure, after work and all this, right? So I'll try to make this talk as uh, enjoyable as possible. So I'm an architect. I've been practicing in Singapore for almost 30 years. And um, I'll just go through some of the projects which I was involved huh, since the 80s. So those people who are involved will know Hotel Rendezvous and uh, this building, the World Trade Center Harbour Pavilion, which is no more there already, I'm afraid. It's uh, now uh, taken over by Vivo City, right? And I've also been involved in MRT stations, the Clark Key MRT station, uh, Jalan Besar Stadium, and uh, some older buildings in, in uh, Junction 10 at uh, the Bukit Panjang uh, uh, area, right? And this is the picture house, which I did with... Uh, with Mr. Tang Wan B, one of the very senior architects in, 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 uh, in the early days as well. Yeah, so I've also had the pleasure of doing a mosque, a church, and some residential apartments here. So you know, in, in my career, I think I've been very fortunate that I've, I've managed to cover a whole gamut of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, building types. So in the, in the early 2000s, uh, my company, CIAP Architects, we did a lot of uh, uh, car showrooms as well. So the, the Nissan car showroom, the Subaru, uh, we supported the, Tan, the Tang Chong group in, in uh, developing all their car showrooms as well. Right then, uh, going down uh, more recently, uh, we did a lot of schools, the ACS International School, uh, NUH Medical Center, um, the Novena Hospital, one of our, uh, the premier flagship hospitals in Singapore, Yishun Community Hospital, and even a fire station. So I didn't ask for this kind of uh, spread of uh, building typologies, but somehow it just landed on me. So I, I thank God for that. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have, to have had so much experiences, right? And then also I, I did a lot of contribution back to the architectural fraternity by being uh, serving as the president for three years. And uh, it was very good. I met a lot of famous people there. Uh, one of our patrons, uh, the late Albert Hong, and uh, also um, promoting good architectural designs uh, among the fraternity and also among the students, right? Okay, so for today, I, I would like to talk about um, this thing called the sixth wave of industrialization. Uh, because um, for those of you all who study economics, you will understand later on why, why the sixth wave is important, right? It is the current wave that we are riding, right? Uh, I will be trying to address some of the challenges that, that architects face in the built environment. And if it's the, in, in the built environment, it concerns everybody, not just the architects as well, right? Because architects can only do so much, but if, 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 we, if we don't follow the, the, whole, uh, the whole idea of trying to save the built environment, I think uh, everybody will suffer for it, right? I will talk about trends in the near and uh, not so far future, uh, some recent experimental thinking, and share with you some of the projects which I've tried to implement principles in which I think are good for the built environment. Uh, one of them being Yishun Community Hospital, of which I'm very proud of it because I won a, we won an SIA Design Award for it. And an interesting uh, uh, a park project, uh, the Hakka Heritage Center, which was a finalist project for 2019 at the World Architectural Festival, which, which is like an Olympiad, if you like, it's the Olympic Games for architecture, right? And then finally, uh, I'll, I'll just like to share also uh, all the 30 years of my experience in actually designing my own house. Uh, 
Uh, I recently completed my own house uh, two years ago. I'm quite proud of it because all the principles of green architecture and, and architecture that is sensitive, I've tried to apply uh, into my project. So therefore, walking the talk. Right, so the sixth wave of technology. Now, if you ask the economists, they will tell you that um, economic development follows the waves of uh, technological advancement. So right from the 17, uh, 1800s, you had the steam engine, right? And they follow in, in waves of about 50 year cycles, you know? So the, 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 the discovery of the steam engine, the next one was the railway and steel, uh, electrification, automobiles, and then the fifth wave was the infocom technology, right? And now we are riding the sixth wave, right? So if, if we are to survive any kind of business, if you want to survive, you have to take into cognizance that this is the latest trend of the technology, right? This thing about AI, digitization, computing power, they will come into play very much. And, and really, if you want to survive and you want to contribute to mankind, I think these are the kind of uh, technologies that you have to leverage upon. And it's about environmental technologies, about biotechnologies, and very importantly, healthcare because of the aging population, right? So some of the key drivers in, in this uh, new economy will be the demographic, the demographic change, right? Implying that people are getting older and living longer. Um, maturing environmental concerns, right? We all talk about global warming and, and the rise of the sea level. Uh, Web-based empowerment, right? Uh, the fact that we can be having this, this uh, conference uh, virtually, I think speaks for itself. Um, the growth of health services, again, directly related to our aging population. And the fact that the, the the computing power will, will get higher and higher, right? We talk about 5G, 5G is coming on, whether we follow the, the Norwegian 5G, the US 5G or the China 5G, it doesn't matter because it is going to be a, a key thing that will drive all our, our lives and our, our, our technology, right? Um, yes. So um, if you want to succeed, you have to do something with waste. This is the kind of thinking that the, the sixth wave of technology and innovation things about, right? Either you cut down waste or you recycle waste, right? That's one way in which we can we can uh, promote uh, the built environment. So waste is not really waste because waste equals opportunity. And businesses now, it's not just only about the product, right? But about selling the service as well. Because as you can see, all, all the, the tech giants, uh, they're going very large into online, online retailing and all this uh, Zoom and, and, and uh, cloud-based communications. So it's more of the service and not just the project, pro, uh, product, that's right. Uh, uh, and and uh, this is the world where the digital and natural are converging, right? The other thinking we have to take note is that bits, meaning to say computer, computer services are global and atoms are local. So anything that you have to do, you have to consider this fact that uh, uh, the physical connection, the physical uh, uh, um, uh, 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 transmission of knowledge and all this is, is somewhat uh, limited. But if you can put it on a digital platform, you can reach many much, very much more people, just like what we're doing here today, right? This kind of conference reaching 5,000 and all this will never be possible if you do it the old way, right? Uh, but then let's not forget that nature is actually the greatest designer. So uh, yes, while we move along in technology, we have to take the cognizance that we are part of nature and the technology must only serve the fact that we are part of nature as well. Okay, so here in Singapore, I, I'm very happy to say that our, our, our scientists and our, our innovators have begun to talk about recycling, right? So they've, they've actually taken rubbish and, and turning them into building materials only, right? So the, 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 the whole prototyping has started already. So it's a question of, I think it will only get better and, and whether the building authorities will allow such things. Uh, of course, the science can prove the, the, the competency of the building material, right? So uh, it has started the revolution. So I'm glad to say that, uh, yes, we have taken the first step really in Singapore. So if you look also at the UN goals for 2030, right? Uh, there are 17 goals here. And out of these 17 goals here, right? More than 50% of it have to do with the built environment. Good health and well-being, clean water, sanitization, affordable, clean energy, a decent working environment, and so on and so forth, right? So the the, the whole idea of industries in the built environment really uh, come to the forefront really, especially where, where the UN is concerned. And of course, when the UN is concerned, it is the whole world that we are talking about. So let's take a look at some of the, the trends in architecture since 2012. Huh? So for those of you all who do not know, there's this award called the Pritzker Prize. The Pritzker Prize, if, you, if I can say, it's like the Nobel Prize for architects, right? 
And since 2012, this, this committee that, that runs the Pritzker Prize have been awarding it to, to uh, architects who have uh, contributed a very uh, huge way into the environment and into community building, community-based projects and community-based architecture, starting with Wang Shu, right? Wang Shu 2012 uh, Pritzker Prize winner. So he goes into these old Chinese villages and he uses the, 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 the material that's from there. And therefore he churns the economy for that particular local village. And he builds buildings which are very much uh, uh, enamored with the earth, with the ground and of supporting the community. Then there's, uh, in 2014, the, the award was given to this very, very good Japanese architect called Shigeru Ban, and he's famous for disaster recovery architecture. For those of you all who have been to Christchurch, he built the Christchurch uh, Cathedral. A lot of it is uh, made of uh, timber, and, and it was a response to the earthquake that, that, that recently happened. And he's also helped the Pakistani people uh, and, and other uh, impoverished societies to build very quick shelters to that, that will become relevant in times of a disaster, right? Uh, then down the line in 2016, Alejandro Aravena, uh, uh, this is a Chilean architect, and uh, he is very famous for also developing community buildings, right? So they, they, they again, they awarded him this, this uh, Pritzker Prize uh, for, for his work with community architecture. And then more recently in 2018, uh, this, this gentleman here, very senior architect, almost 90 years old, Balakrishnan Doshi, right? Again, contributing very much his work towards uh, bettering the, the, the community, bettering the, the agricultural uh, scene, and helping the, the, the marginalized in society. Right. So the, the signal is very clear that uh, architects is just not about great. Uh, it's just not about great buildings only. It's about helping the community, and that's where I think that we can add most value. And for me, the biggest statement of what I, I was trying to say just now was the fact that. When the Japanese built the Olympic Stadium, the latest Olympic Stadium, which unfortunately we, we couldn't get to see because of the COVID, pandi uh, COVID pandemic, if not that it would happen here, right? It would happen, at, uh, yeah, about this, uh, sorry, in July. So they actually uh, gave up the, the lower design, uh, which was uh, done by a very, she's a very competent architect, I mean, the late Zaha Hadid, but her building was very, very expensive. And I think I'm very happy that the Japanese came to the census and they did a very sensible building, which would use, um, less resources, but nonetheless, still very much relevant to their culture, right? There's a, there's a certain over, overtone of Orientalism around the building. So to me, if the, the Japanese society, probably one of the most technologically advanced societies in the world, have taken this step to say that architecture and the built environment is not about flamboyance, but it's about meaning and uh, the responsible use of resources, it says very much where the whole trend of the built environment is going. Right, so, so here in Singapore, uh, we have quite a, a, a matured building industry. Uh, and I would like to say that our new role is for architects is to be healers of the built environment, right? So it's not just about sustainability, but the holistic wellness of the built environment. Climatic response, yes. Economy of construction, your construction has to be efficient, has to be uh, quality construction. It has to be productive, buildable, right? Safe to build. Uh, it has to cater for all kinds of society, marginalized people, the disabled, easy to maintain and nuisance free as well. Because in Singapore, we, we are very used to high density living, right? You, you really cannot build something without interfering with the rest of your community. So the less nuisance your health, your buildings are uh, create, the better, I would say, is your, your building, right? Uh, and uh, the other key thing is to be very, very responsible with your use of resources and technology, right? So again, the deeper meaning of beauty and not just superficial beauty of a building. I think the rigor of truth, rational and logic and very important evidence-based, right? If you say that I decide to go for a round building, then I think you must justify why your building needs to be round instead of rectangular, right? A simple uh, truth like that. So are we solving the challenges of the day? So interestingly, right, uh, Singapore, very advanced society, but if you look at some of the comments that people make since uh, 2012, right, uh, they actually want a greater sense of home, right? And what is a greater sense of home? A slower pace. They talk about nature, farmers, market, slower pace, right? Things which are very humanistic, right? And not so much about large, huge buildings, right? And we know that in Singapore, um, we have an aging population and this this article was done uh, was about i think about 2012 
right? So eight years down the line, we see that a lot of the nursing homes are being built in place nearer to the housing estates now because old people really, they, they, they like to familiar surroundings uh, rather than uh, moving them around. Okay, um, hospitals facing a bed crunch. Uh, this was the time of SARS. And even now, I think uh, this, this pandemic has shown that uh, we have to rethink the way we design our hospitals, right? Because we, the epidemiologists tell us that this is not going to be the last epidemic, right? There will be other diseases coming in, other viruses. And how can our hospitals up their design to cater for such emergency situations, right? Uh, speed is very important. Uh, here we have evidence that a childcare center being built in four, just four and a half months, right? Uh, so again, I mentioned this thing about construction nuisance. Very important to build your building, causing very little nuisance to your neighbor, right? Uh, and uh, the duality of a, a building also is important, meaning to say that one building does not only just serve one particular purpose, right? So here you have uh, three buildings which are actually multi-purpose, right? You have the indoor sports hall, which uh, actually uh, serves the, the community in the weekend. But in, of course, in the, in the weekdays, it serves the kids at school. Then you have the very famous, um, um, this is Bado, right? No, not sorry, not Bado, Tampanese Hub, right? Everything for the community is there. It's done by DP Architects, very uh, competent uh, design firm as well. And this other building here, the Bukit Panjang Hawker Centre, which includes a community centre and other facilities as well. So nowhere in the world you, you, have, uh, you have buildings like that have very much shared purpose, right? And, and we do this because of our scarcity of land resource. So you will find that in time to come, buildings, the, the construction of buildings will, will follow more the assembly mentality. It's almost like building a car, right? So building components will be built off-site, right? Like a car. A building actually can be fragmented into many, many small components which will be built off-site. And what happens is that all these components will be brought onto the site and assembled rather than constructed, right? With, with the hope of robots possibly, I think. Uh, this thing AI will, will, will come in very much into the construction technology, right? Uh, and robots will be the thing of the day on, on, on site. And, and, and this will, will, will cut down, will make buildings safer. It will uh, cut down accidents. And I dare say that it will also attract a younger generation into construction industry because uh, around the world, it, it has been, been, been a trend that a lot of the young people are no longer inter interested in the construction industry because it suffers from the, the stigma of being dirty, dangerous and difficult, right? So uh, technology and all this will help to, to, to make it a, a safer industry for, for and, and a more interesting industry for the younger uh, job seekers to come into, right? And, and the cars will evolve just like the buildings will evolve. When the parts and the components move along every five years, you can have also evolution of, of car design. You can also have evolution of building designs, right? And in Singapore also, we're thinking about uh, this kind of what we call prefabricated rooms, you know, where, where building blocks are completed and they finish all in one go. So, so the, the whole block, when it comes in, is completed with the toilet, with the, with the tiles, with the curtains, even with the electricity, and they're stacked on top of one another. So there are some examples of this uh, being already happening in Singapore. Uh, one famous example is this uh, building at the, our airport. I think it's an extension of the, the hotel down there. And it's a design by a very famous architect called uh, Woha, right, in Singapore. So I give credit to their, to their pioneering efforts in, in, in using this technology in building, right? So what about kinetic architecture, right? So this is an example of kinetic architecture where the sun shading actually morphs and moves according to the climatic conditions, right? So, so uh, uh, the technology will only get better and better, and, and, and you will see that there's lot, there'll be a lot of uh, mechanization of, of uh, building components. So engineering will feature very much, mechanical engineering will feature very much in the architecture of the future, right? Um, you will see also that there will be the application of robotics in construction, as I mentioned earlier. So this is a very simple robot. It's just uh, building the wall. But I'm sure this, uh, in time to come, you have larger robots, more sophisticated robots that can make uh, more, no, more sophisticated building components. So really, the architecture is really limited to just your imagination only because it's just a case of program, programming the robot to, to make this building form. 
So some of our local architects also have been pioneering some, some thinking of how the, the new societies uh, can develop and how new settlements should be, right? So here you have a, a good friend of mine, architect taking soon, and he's done some experiments on how each community precinct can be self-contained within a, a circle of uh, two to one and a half to two kilometers. So within this thing, you have offices, you have playground, you have schools, and you have even your own farms around. So very interesting thinking of a good land use uh, and how uh, villages and settlements can, 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 can even uh, settle in Singapore to incorporate urban farming as well. Right, so he has done some statistics and he has shown that uh, really uh, that, that, that if, 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 if the land is used carefully, right, we can use, use our land very efficiently and uh, there's a lot of land space to go as well instead of of concentrating right the, the lands in, in high-rise uh, developments why not spread it out more evenly and have a, a more humane environment to live in right so he has done a test on uh, Bukit Panjang I think if you're interested you can contact him he'll, he'll be more than happy to share with you his ideas of how he, he can implement the, these new settlements within a, a HDB precinct right and also dreaming in the future, another friend of mine, a great architect, local architect Tan Cheng Siong, he talks about Skyland, where the whole ground level is being freed up for the more mundane activities of transportation and things like that, where, and, and the more livable environment is pushed onto the second level. So imagine the entire land of Singapore is, has a second level, and the, the, the more green and the more nicer spaces are on the upper level, whereas the more functional stuff like the transportation, and the more, uh, I would say, well, for want of a better word, the more messy stuff is done below, right? Instead of digging into a basement. So yes, a lot of new experimental thinking going on. Uh, he has uh, done some studies as well, and he calls his his uh, his project, so-called project Skyland, right? So some of the images that he has uh, churned up. Yeah, so in the not too distant future, uh, this is a dream. Of course, it's a dream. Uh, it's a dream concept. But here you have a spacecraft actually mining space. You know, they go into space and they capture this this uh, moving asteroid and they drag it back to maybe about just outside the orbit of Earth and it's full of minerals and aluminium and 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 and, and magnesium and all those minerals that we need for for our products and our life in in uh, on Earth, right? So can this happen? Uh, great thinking, right? So without imagination. Nothing can happen. So I, I really applaud these uh, these thinkers who, who talk about the future of, of, of mining as well and technology, right? And and what about floating cities, right? Uh, how do we extend, right? Um, they are not new. They've been happening. This is Ton Le Sap, uh, in, in Siam Reap, near, near Cambodia, in Siam, Siam Reap. But the same concept has been already, the revolution has begun and it's been, uh, been, been implemented in Holland, right? So Holland, of course, you know, they are water masters and they are forced to do it because a lot of their land is below the sea level. So they are preparing for a time when the dikes is not, are not good enough and the water comes in, right? So they've already started floating villages, floating modern floating villages, modern floating uh, uh, settlements, right? Which you can see are quite elegant. Uh, so uh, with ingenuity, I think uh, we can master the environment is, is what the Dutch has shown us, right? And in Japan, they've been thinking of the Shimizu Corporation have been thinking about green floats as well. So they were interested and they came down to Singapore uh, to talk about this idea. And why Singapore? Because we are fortunate to have very protected seas, right? Whereas in Japan and, and, and like Philippines, every other day you have a typhoon. So <laughs> the sea is very unstable in those areas. So they are thinking that if, if they could have a very stable, stable kind of water area, harbor, right? Like we have in Singapore, this kind of idea of having green floats can work. Right, where you have a, a large mega floating structures of say three meter, three kilometers across, uh, with, with with building components and even floating fields and floating farms and whatnot. Right, so again, dreaming ahead. But uh, I think this is a much viable alternative than living underground. So uh, and it's not new because we know that in in Norway, where they do drilling of the North Sea. Right, uh, people stay out there. The, the workers stay out there for six months on this this so-called flotel, right? Which includes a, a, a helicopter, and they can survive there for six months. And this is now. So the technology will only get better to allow us to float our cities, right? So here are some examples of architects dreaming of how floating cities can be. And I think that the float the idea of the floating city is definitely much uh, 
much better than um, um, what do you call an underground subterranean kind of lifestyle, right? So I can't imagine if let's say we had a pandemic in a subterranean environment, that would be really disastrous, right? And it's also very expensive and dangerous to be digging basements. It's far more safer and I think more, more natural in the sense that you can see the environment if you afloat a city rather than you bury a city underground. Right, so I'll, I'll just like to, to speak a bit about some of the projects in which I've tried to incorporate ideas of sustainability here. So in Singapore, as I mentioned, you have close proximity to everything, very tight communal spaces, right? And like it or not, whatever you do, you will affect your neighbor. So stakeholder and community engagement is very much important, right? Uh, we have a very uh, strong building construction authority and they mandate sustainability, right? And low energy consumption as well. Right, so every building that you see in Singapore, the architects struggle and they, with the engineers to make sure that uh, they are resource efficient and they consume as little energy as possible within the confines of the the, law, the mandate of the law. Right, uh, buildability and constructability is also mandated. Right, um, one of the key things is that we have to prove before we, we implement our project, we have to prove to the building construction authority that our our building uh, achieves a certain high score of buildability and constructability. And we are very respectful of our workers as well. So our buildings also have to be designed for safety, safe to build and safe to maintain as well. So again, these are some of the laws that are coming in into in the Singapore built environment. Uh, they, they make our work very difficult, but I think it's very meaningful, even though it's difficult, it's very meaningful. Right, so I, I speak about the, the hospitals, the design of a hospital, because uh, my company is uh, quite famous for building hospitals. We are one of the leading healthcare architects in Singapore. And when we build a hospital, it's never about the architect, okay? It's always about the patient and building a healing environment. Now, the, the design of a hospital, just like a hotel, the first five minutes is very important because when you come to a hospital, you are sick and you're not well. So the last thing you want to do is to come into an environment which makes you depressed, right? So we take a lot of pains by making sure that the first five minutes impression of coming to our hospitals, right, is the same like when you come to a very good hotel. When you come to a good hotel, you enter the lobby, you know it's a good hotel and you know you're going to have a very good stay. So it's the same thing with the hospital, right? Uh, close to nature and daylight penetration with the external is also an important uh, element in designing hospitals because it is proven that if you are recovering in a hospital and you are close to nature and daylight, you will recover faster than being in a very uh, dingy and enclosed area, right? And hospitals also are very uh, confusing buildings. So the way we, we model our buildings, the way we site our blocks has to be intuitive, right? By, by looking at the building, you will be able to tell which is the ward, which is the administrative block, how do you circulate through the building as well. Right? And uh, unique to Singapore hospitals, our local architects have taken great pains to segregate the, the patient traffic from the public traffic, right? uh, from the public to the private. Right? So the, the, those days where, where you have somebody being wheeled across the lobby of a hospital, that kind of thing will never happen in Singapore already because that's considered as a taboo kind of design. Right? So we, help, we hope to market this expertise around the ASEAN region to actually up the empty of all the medical facilities in the ASEAN region using our, our what we've learned here in Singapore. So this is a hospital called the Yishun Community Hospital. I've had the very great pleasure of uh, working with some of the top experts here in the, in the industry. And we were given the challenge to say that, okay, this hospital, when you design it, you must be proud and good enough for your own mother to stay in. Now, what is a community hospital? A community hospital is a place where the general hospital, the acute hospital, cannot do anything more for you. You know, when you go to a hospital in Singapore, when you go to the acute hospital, your limit there is approximately seven days. If after seven days, they cannot, they cannot do anything for you, they will have to move you off to another place called the community hospital where you will recuperate, right? So that you will free up the bed for the next patient who is... Uh, needs it more urgently than you, right? So this is the challenge of the community hospital, right? So our concept was uh, from developed from the longhouse in Borneo, right? If you see the longhouse in Borneo, they've elevated all their living areas up there. The ground floor space is more of a community space. And of course, they did it for reasons of uh, flood control as well. 
But we thought that this was a very interesting idea to be adapting into a hospital. And, and therefore, we, we used the same idea of lifting all the main key hospital activities above the, the public street, right? If you like the public grade and, uh, zone. And on this public grade zone is where how our greenery, and this allows the whole site to breathe uh, so that air and greenery can flow through the development. Right. So just to orientate you, this is a Kutek Prat Hospital. The new, the, the, the community hospital that we did was here. So it's a very simple U-shaped plan here where it houses 420 uh, beds. And here is the administrative and the geriatric center of the hospital. And what we did is we tried to, to bring in the nature to carry on what Kutek Prat Hospital did right through bringing in nature and, and the environment into the hospital, right? So this is a schematic diagram of how we tried to achieve this thing about bringing uh, the whole idea of the nature from the pond and the garden per pervading into the hospital environment. Therefore, the hospital is seemingly a green hospital within a garden, right? So when we finish, this is what the, the idea looked look like in aerially, right? And we've also uh, tried to use elements of equator equatorial architectural design, the idea of shade and play, apertures and views, screens and porosities, right? So this is the, the finished view. Uh, this was this photo was taken I think, quite, quite long ago, almost four years, but it's much more green now. So just by looking at, at this building, you sort of can gauge that this is the place where the patients are going to reside. And this is the um, administrative block because it's an air-conditioned air building, right? This one is not, this one is naturally ventilated. So the building is purposely kept narrow so that you can have a great sense of cross ventilation going through the building, right? So I spoke about the first five minutes impression. So this is the kind of impression you get when you come to Yishun Community Hospital. The Greens would welcome you to tell you that this is a place of rest and you have confidence that when you stay here, you will recover and you will get back to normalcy, right? Uh, again, uh, the drop off to have a, a strong sense of a safe arrival uh, lots of greenery being infused into the building, right? And uh, the lobby is large uh, because um, uh, we prepare for pandemics, you know. So the lobby is actually a multi-purpose space. Um, while, yes, we know that for every patient that is warded, you have the whole, maybe 10 or 20 people coming to visit him. But of course, now it's not allowed. So we have to create a very ample space at the, the ground floor. And all these ample spaces are now being used for the COVID-19 pandemic response. So in a way, we were ready in that sense, right? So I think this will, you will see that nowadays in the design of the hospital, this would be the mainstream thinking where, where the ground floor of the hospital will be freed up for emergency responses, right? Another view of the drop-off, very generous, uh, lots of light and daylight penetration. So simple strategies of using trees to actually screen off what, is the ambulance drop off over the other side, right? Uh, a, a very simple welcoming ambience and being a public hospital, we had to be very conscious of that we do not use materials which are expensive, uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, there are competent materials uh, that last and look good as well, right? So that's the challenge, how to make your building economical and look elegant at the same time. So even, even the, the, the way we have greened our building, uh, we've allowed the green to come all over the, the, the spaces, right? And even right down into the basement car park. And the idea of the green coming into basement car park actually serves as a wayfinding device because when you have light and greenery coming into the basement car park, uh, as, you, as you drive along the basement car park, you will see this place. And this is the place where you put the escalator for people to go up. So again, a, a, a strategy and a device for intuitive wayfinding within a hospital. So this is the community village square, which, which is in between the two, uh, the two wards. Again, a, a place for the, for the patients who can come down and, and walk around and enjoy the green environment. Uh, from up there, when they look down into the village square, this is what they, they will see. Uh, so you will notice uh, there's a lot of uh, greenery infused as well, right? So we have used uh, all, all the, 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 the components here are prefabricated, right? They are pre prefabricated, prefabricated off-site, they are brought in and they are assembled rather than constructed. Uh, so when the green is finished, this is what it looks like. I think it's quite a, a nice environment to be in. Not that 
it's nice to stay in a hospital, but if you have to stay in a hospital, then you might as well make the environment nice, nice and uh, restful for you to be in. Right? So I spoke about the creamery going down into the basement car park. This is what it looks like. Uh, and I think I must have done something right here because I, this is one of my favorite pictures because when I was walking around the hospital, I found these Muslim ladies here uh, uh, doing their, their, their prayers. And, and, and of course, they are facing the Mecca, but, but the fact that I can have a place that is so restful within a hospital that, that allows the Muslim people to say their prayers, I think I'm very proud of this, this picture, right? So this, uh, you, you can see that uh, the lots of uh, public spaces and benches and release. So the hospital doesn't, doesn't become a place of taboo, really. It becomes almost like a, a, a beacon of the community, you know, right? So it's very important uh, so that when, when, when people know that if I'm living next to a hospital, it's, it's not a bad thing, right? But it's a good thing, right? So that, uh, it, 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 I mean, getting sick and death and life is a very, very, pretty much part of the whole uh, cycle of uh, life, right? So again, how, how to infuse greenery within, right? So here you have, you have the, the just to show you uh, that uh, after we designed the thing, it came out really looking very much like our design and, 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 and really a very uh, impressive view of the hospital here. So we've taken a lot of pains to, to put greenery and allow natural ventilation to come into our buildings, right? Uh, it's so green that we, we, know, we, we understand that birds and butterflies, birds have been nesting here as well. And, and every day you visit from butterflies and, and creatures of nature, right? Which is really quite nice to be in when you're recovering long stay in a hospital, right? Uh, efforts to put in uh, deep sunshade to prevent uh, the sun and rain from coming in, but at the same time, allowing the window to, to be open for natural ventilation. So this is a view that you get as you walk around the hospital, lots of shade, lots of green. Uh, and, and we know in Singapore, sometimes our rain comes in horizontally, right? So you can never have a wide enough corridor, right? So we, we have this very expressed and very extended uh, sun shading to keep the rain out during the tropical rainstorm, right? Uh, so again, uh, we've infused textures of tree bark on our on our facade here, which is also, so every component that you see here is actually manufactured offsite in a factory, brought in and assembled, right? So the idea of textures and very earthy tones will give you a restful environment. Uh, so this is a very interesting picture also that um, shows you architectonic, architectonic play of reflections and solid and void. Uh, the connection to Kute Pwat uh, using uh, 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 artificially, sorry, uh, naturally daylight membrane. Uh, green connections from Kute Pwat to the to the hospital. Remember, I spoke about the green corridor. So this is part of the green corridor that actually comes from the park over yonder down in the pond, right? So another view again. So uh, here you have naturally ventilated uh, what we call simulation kitchens, where the stroke victims will get a chance to, to train up their skills again in cooking, right? So we, 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 we actually uh, simulate a kind of a home environment to make them ready after staying here for six weeks, so that when they go back to their home environment, they will not they can, they can carry on normalcy as much as possible. So some of the, uh, the old people here re recovering within a nice uh, naturally, ven naturally ventilated uh, space. Uh, we also try to simulate the HDB housing development living room, right? Uh, so they do, uh, the people staying here will not feel estranged, right? So in every, anywhere you go, there's lots of daylight penetration and green as well. Even our toilets, uh, we try to make them as hands-free as possible so that you don't have to touch anything. Everything is sensor, infusion of green and natural daylight as well. And here you can see the condition of what it looks like in the ward, uh, the natural daylight coming in. So very large, a large uh, percentage of penetration of daylight coming in, right? Uh, all the surfaces in the hospital have to be clean and, 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 and uh, easy to clean, right? So uh, even when the patient is lying down, they can have a glimpse of the outside so they won't feel so depressed when they're lying down all the time, right? The quality of light is quite nice in combination with uh, some of the artificial lighting that we have put in. It's like stuck. Yeah, so even the, 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 the plants that we choose huh, uh, are very sensitive. Uh, we make sure that the, the landscape is not... Um, too, too manicured, okay, because we want a kind of a very natural kind of, of growth of plants. 
um, passive building strategies, meaning to say that before we, we move on to energy guzzling, mechanical and electrical solutions, we try to exhaust all the natural passive architectural strategies first, right? Things, unless we really cannot solve it, then we resort to mechanical and electrical systems, right? So this is the way to achieve a green building, right? So of course, um, even if we decide to go for mechanical systems, we have solar heaters uh, uh, that actually heat the hot water in the supply for the hospitals because hot water is one of those things which are, are very much consume energy in, in, a, in a hospital. So I, I think probably about 50 to 60% of the energy used for hot water in this hospital comes free from the solar heaters that we have infused. And even the building technology that we put in, right? All, we, we don't use the traditional way of uh, concrete casting. All these components are fabricated offsite and they are brought in and assembled. So here we have our former minister, Kobon Wan. He was very uh, minister of national development. He was very intrigued by our construction. We invited him in and we've proven that we could actually cut down the construction time. What used to take 27 months for a conventional uh, way of, con of, of building things, we have managed to cut it down to 24 months. So uh, a very good saving of three months and therefore three months of less nuisance for the environment as well, right? And the way we've designed our facade, we allow 80% uh, of, the, of, of the, the, the time, we have a lot of shading at the same time, uh, letting in uh, 65 percent of the facade can remain open even during a, a rainy day, letting in air but keeping the rain out. So these are some of the challenges that architects have to have to uh, adopt and, and face when they design buildings, right? Uh, so very much stakeholder and community engagement. <clears throat> the final product is just just the building only, but the way I mean, the the the, the amount of engagement that we have with the staff of the hospital and the community. Is, is pretty much just as important, right? If not, it, because it can take about maybe more than a year to design the hospital even before it gets on ground, you know? So uh, first principles of studying mock-ups, we actually role play a patient, role play the doctor to make sure that we get all our ergonomics right as well, right? And finally, when we finish the building, we are very happy that it's very nicely nestled within Yishun, right? So, um, um, one of my jobs here is that every month I have to give a briefing to the residence committee. Yeah, here's, so here is me trying uh, briefing them on the progress of the project. And I think finally everybody is happy and uh, we had a very successful uh, time doing this project. And, uh, and yes, uh, it, it was just a good feeling. And, and the best of all is that we managed to win an award for this building. So I'm quite proud of this building. Right, so next I would just like to briefly take you through my own house. So the, uh, I, I live in Serangoon Gardens, it's a terrace house. And the challenge of a terrace house is that it only has two facades, the front and the back. So how do you bring in light and ventilation, right? So this was the whole, the whole concept behind the house, right? Uh, so uh, interestingly, I, I, I did it with one of my students, uh, a young talented architect named Mickey, and uh, we developed this design together. So these are some of the the concepts that we have adopted, you can see that uh, very much porous kind of facade, uh, letting in light and ventilation as well, right? Uh, another view here, right? And so the finished product. So you can see that from here, you, you, you look right through, you can see through the house. So this gives you an idea of how porous the, the whole house, house, house in. Uh, um, and and, and to, to screen off the, 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 the light and to have some privacy, we have this um, movable rain screens, what I call rain screens. Okay, so this is a cross-section view of the house. I have a very active uh, skylight up there. And this skylight can open and it allows very much all the ventilation to come in, sort of like a stack effect, right? So this is the diagram of the ventilation diagram showing how it works, how this house breathes, if I can use the word and how I collect the rainwater inside the house. And before I discharge it down into open, I use it as a kind of a beautifying feature within the house, you know. So this is very much encouraged by our water agency, PUB. They call it active, beautiful and clean. I don't think there are many houses who, who do this, where they bring in the water and uh, they beautify the house first. There's fish, of course, before the water is released into the public drain. 
Uh, so this is another view of the house showing its porosity. And of course, all the materials here are very much natural. I don't paint any on my walls. If it's a timber, I express the timber. If it's concrete, I express the concrete. If it's steel, I, I use steel. Uh, so this is the, 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 the ground floor. Uh, my wife is an artist potter. So this is where she, she does her work, her paintings and her pottery. And, and this, this on the side here is the pond, which I was referring to, where rainwater will come down, collect and then flow out into the the public drain, right? My my uh, communal kitchen, my favorite part of the house. Uh, so this is a view of my living room. So I can I can slide the screens open or close depending on the condition of the weather outside, right? Uh, some of the views inside the the atrium that lets the the light and the ventilation through as well. So I have a small little atrium going to the house, and there's ventilation going in. So this is a view. This is what my neighbor sees. I don't get to see it, unfortunately. <laughs> but my neighbor sees it, so I, I hope he enjoys the view. Yeah, so this is uh, to talk about how the rainwater is coming into the house and how it discharges outside. Uh, some very artistic photographs which I took. Uh, the, community, the community kitchen, one of my favorite places in the house. Uh, that's at night, and this is at the daytime. And this is the welcome entry, my, my garden, small little garden that I've created um, in, in my house. Uh, so even the doors here, they are pivoted so that I make maximum ventilation going through the house. Right, so finally, the, fin my, the last project I'm just going to talk about for the next five minutes or so is a reju rejuvenation project. For those of y'all who take the train past Commonwealth and Marty Station, you will notice that there are a lot of gravestones here at somewhere near Commonwealth, right? So this is the old Hakka Cemetery. So the project really was to rejuvenate the whole, uh, what used to be a cemetery into a park actually really. And also to, so that this park can attract the, the younger people into the, the Hakka Hui Kwan and, and, and ingratiate themselves about Hakka culture, right? So we, 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 we actually uh, dug up all the old tombs and, and rehoused all the niches within these uh, mole hills and these mole hills really become like a park, you know? Uh, and then we, we have, of course, we have our new columbarium here and we, we retain the old uh, ancestral hall. And this is the Hakka Center, Hakka Cultural Center, where maybe you can have tuition, you can have your Hakka Yong Tau Fu, uh, all the Hakka goodies that, that you can buy, right? So we, this project was quite successful. We, we managed to uh, enter the World Architectural Festival as finalists. And uh, we hope that the Hui Kwan, the, the association, can raise enough money to build this project, right? So I'm just going uh, very quickly through. So here you have Commonwealth Avenue. Uh, and when, as you take the MRT down towards Holland, you can see these uh, old derelict gravestones there. So some of the contacts that you have around and what we intend to do, right? So a, a picture of the, the park, what it is now, it's almost very regimented. And so we're going to take all these uh, old urns and gravestones and rehouse them in a very naturalistic park that is here, right? So some of the axil uh, to, to, to tell you all the different eras in which the buildings were being built, right? Uh, again, overtones of Hakka and Oriental uh, architecture. Uh, so this is the kind of the, the new sort of very, uh, uh, it's Chinese in overtone, but lots of natural materials being infused in it. A huh? uh, close-up view of what the the, the columbarium will look like. Uh, so it's, it's, it, it becomes like a park really, right? So the whole idea is that again, the park and the, the cemetery, it was what was, was the cemetery becomes a park. The park and, and cemetery coexist. Remember I spoke about the duality of, 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 uh, of, of, of development in Singapore, that due to land scarce, huh, we have to think of creative ways in how to use our land efficiently. So this is one, one way we do it, suggestion, right? So you have very nice play mounds. So imagine your children coming and, and skateboarding around Akong's tomb, <laughs> right? And skateboarding around uh, the auntie who has passed away, come and visit her. The whole place becomes a very nice and lively playground instead of a, 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 a depressing cemetery, right? So I'd just like to say, finally, uh, the, the architects, uh, the new built environment, uh, we have to be serious and thoughtful socialists socially responsible architects are problem solvers. Buildings must be simple to build and maintain and above all, add meaning to life. So I leave you 
with this video of the Hakka Heritage Center. Yeah, so incidentally, the, the soundtrack to that video was actually written by uh, uh, Mini's, uh, Mini's son. He's also an architect, he's working with me. So I just want to thank him for the very beautiful soundtrack. So uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's the first time I heard that, that music. It's nice. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He never, sorry, Paul. Um, he never told me about it until I, you mentioned it and I asked him. That's the only time I learned about it. So um, he must be doing a lot of things without letting us know. But yeah, yeah, that was nice. Thank you also for helping me, helping him. Anyway, um, that has been a very um, formative, impressive, enlightening, uh, I don't know what words. Uh, or kind of um, presentation, and I'm sure there will be a number of questions waiting for you. But um, before we do that, uh, let's just have a word from our sponsor, PNB. PNB, thank you so much for supporting this webinar. Uh, can we have our video again for PNB, please? Thank you. Building a home for your family in the Philippines? Get connected with the right partner. Your house and lot, condominium, home improvement, and loan takeout is made easy with PNB's OPHL. It's available at PNB LA, New York, Tokyo, Nagoya, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Middle East. OPHL allows borrowers to pay in local currency without remittance fees. No co-borrower required. Qualified borrowers must also have good credit standing, stable employment, and sufficient disposable income. Loan up to 80% of the property value and enjoy easy payment terms. Visit the nearest PNB branch to apply today. Call on PNB to uh, have a word, word from our sponsor, please. Uh, thank you, Mini. Uh, to our kababayans in Singapore, uh, mabuhay. Magandang gabi po. I'm Christy Vicentina, uh, General Manager of Philippine National Bank. That's for my day job. So pag nakikita niyo po ako dito, that's a volunteer work. So ito po yung may bayad. <laughs> so PNB operates as a bank in Singapore and we are the only a bank that offers a financing for your uh, purchase of property in the Philippines through our own Philippine home loan. And it is unique to Philippine National Bank and it's offered across the globe. So visit us at Laki Plaza. We're located at Unit 0302. But on top of our housing loan, we also offer pangarap loan. So for those who are looking for quick finances or short-term finances, please wag na po kayong pumunta dun sa mga nasa lower level that charges 4% per month. So you can visit us at PNB and uh, we have at 1% per month. 
And of course, you can also visit us uh, for your SSS and Pag-ibig payments. And we actually allow SSS to have their uh, uh, shops located inside the branch on Saturdays and Sundays. So you can visit us at Lucky Plaza. And of course, we can remit your money anywhere, uh, either credit with PNB or credit with other banks. Any bank in the Philippines, pwede po kaming mag-credit. Or kung wala pong banko yung padadalhan natin, we can credit and they can pick it up from our partners, uh, Cebuana, uh, PNB, uh, Palawan Pound Shop, and RD Pound Shop, and a lot more. So we can service all your remittance needs and we can guarantee you that we offer better FX rate and definitely better FX rate than the competitor local banks. So see you at Lucky Plaza. We're located at Unit 0302 or you can call us at 6737 Four six four six. We are open Monday to Sunday, and you can also uh, check our website at www.pnb.com.th/singapore. So, maraming maraming salamat po. Back to you, Mini. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to PNB for supporting our webinar. And PNB has always been with us and um, very supportive. So, thank you. Uh, and now, I'm sure you are all eager to have your questions asked, uh, our architect, uh, Mr. Theodore. I will shall call on our guest moderator, uh, Mark, who is uh, the president of UAP Singapore chapter. So Mark, over to you, please. Hi, good evening. Uh, good evening, architect Theodore Chan. That was a nice uh, talk that you've given to us for the future of built environment in, a, in our age for today. So. There's a question, what is the difference in prefabricated buildings compared to the normal brick and mortar construction method? Okay, um, of course, the, most of us, or at least the older generation, will be very familiar with a, a mason. And probably you, that's the way you do it in, in the Philippines, I think, probably in the provinces, right? You get a guy who's laying a brick, 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 brick. But that is a very, um, um, a very slow and a very unproductive way because it, it's very labor intensive. And it's also very much dependent on the skill of the worker, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, even the Japanese, you know, even the Japanese, they, they, they tell me when I speak to the Japanese architects and the contractors, they tell me that the young people are no longer interested in this, doing this kind of craft, right? So how do you, do you circumvent this thing? So the whole idea is that imagine if, to build a wall, you have to lay brick by brick that will take maybe half a day. Whereas if this wall can be sort of cast in concrete off the off-site in a factory somewhere and just bring it in and you just erect it, right? It probably uses probably uh, just two guys instead of four guys, right? So the, the, the idea is that you have better quality finish, right, in, in, in the factory. Uh, less reliance on labor, which for Singapore, okay, I mean, there's of course the economic question, right? But for, for a country like Philippines, maybe you have a lot of labor down there. But for Singapore, I think the push towards um, reliance on, on foreign labor is something which is which everybody is looking at. It's also safer to build, less chances for danger and collapse, right? And you get a better finish or so. So it's faster, it's cleaner, huh? and it's safer. These are the... the, 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 the the whole psychology of why you need to go into prefabrication, right? Um, faster is an important thing in Singapore because like I told you, uh, we are a very dense society here. Uh, you just reach out your hand, you hit somebody already, right? So the, the faster your building works go, the less nuisance you will create, right? And everybody will thank you for that. Huh? Yeah, so th those are the main uh, advantages of going prefabrication over the brick and mortar thing. I agree to that because I've been working with HDB projects, so I think that uh, doing some HDB projects, uh, having the prefabricated buildings is much more uh, faster compared to the one using the normal brick and mortar construction method. Thank you, sir. For the second question is, on designs by Pak Keng Soon, how much of it is now being implemented? I'm afraid <laughs> nothing yet because uh, King Soon again, he's, uh, while he's, uh, he's a gold medalist, you know, while he's a very talented architect, he's also a very good theorist, right? Um, but, um, you know, like everything else, you have to convince the government 
whether your idea works. But I think on paper, at least I admire him for all these his strategies and his thoughts that he's been putting into how uh, is, is there another alternative model than the current HDB design, you know? Because the, the idea is that the HDB design is, is, is uh, you know, in Singapore, it's very much siloed. You have residential, then you have industrial zone, then you have school zone, that kind of thing. And, and therefore, you, you, you have a situation where the central business district, district is concentrated with all the banks and all the offices and all this, and therefore, the, 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 the value of the whole land goes up and everybody is commuting towards the city and that makes it very, very uh, messy and crowded, right? So I think he's thinking of how his, his, his idea as to this urbanization is that can we not decentralize and have little satellite villages and within the villages, uh, uh, we even have our own small farms and can those small farms support that one to two kilometer radius of a development? Now, why do you do this? So that you minimize traveling because the more you travel, the more ungreen you are, right? You will, you, you will, you will, you will use up energy and all this. So if we can can help sustain uh, small little communities, right? Um, could that be an answer? So while while there's still a lot of work to be done, but I think what it shows is that there's just a lot of interesting thinking, you know, that even within Singapore, tight space at Singapore, decentralization could be could be the answer. And if you think about it, the government actually has begun to do it already because you see satellites towns coming up in um, Paliba, right? The Paliba quarter. You have one more in the west, uh, somewhere around Jam and all this. So the idea of decentralizing from the city is something which um, is worthwhile thinking. I think those people in Manila, you know already, right? It gets to a point where it's so crowded. The traffic jams are amazing, right? Uh, really not negotiable, even in places like Jakarta and Bangkok. So Singapore, I, uh, we, we, we are very conscious not to come into that kind of situation. And I, therefore, we have all this thinking going on. How can we decentralize the services so that we don't have to have that kind of urban, urban congestion? Yeah. Yes, I agree to that. By putting some satellites in different regions or in cities, uh, this will uh, remove the traffic and the conjunction, I mean, junction in different uh, places, uh, lessing more traffic and um, more faster for people to connect and communicate. Thank you, sir. For our third question, are there certain government requirements regarding greenery in hospitals, hotels, and other buildings? Yes, I think uh, our planning authority in Singapore, in fact, now they encourage you to, to green your buildings, you know, such that um, whatever green space your buildings take up when they are being built, you have to replace them either on the roof or the building or on the facade of the building. So this is called the landscape replacement area, landscape replacement ratio. So in other words, whatever you lose when it was a green site, you have to put it on the vertical on the top. So the, the URA is encouraging that. For our case in, 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 in Ishun Community Hospital, we were not subject to that because this was done before the, the policy came in, right? The landscape replacement ratio policy came in. But we had there a very, um, I would say he's a, he's, he's a very, um, uh, the CEO of, of then Yishun Community Hospital, Mr. Liak Ping Lit, he was a man with very great vision. And he, he, he really believed in, in, in the idea that yes, a community hospital, you know, the, the patients in a community hospital, they, they stay there for average of about six to eight weeks, sometimes even 12 weeks, you know. So it's long stay, right? Because they are recuperating from a broken leg, from a stroke or something. So they have to go through physiotherapy and all this. So you really got to make the place as pleasant and as restful for them. And one way to do it is to make it infused with greenery and all this. Yeah, sure. So because greenery means you have to maintain. But I think it's worthwhile maintaining because like I said from the start, right, the design of a hospital is always about the patient, right? So if we can make the building and the garden support and make the patient recover faster, why not? So they took that, that uh, stand. Uh, so I, I believe that that was... Who take part in, in Ishun Community Hospital are probably the greenest hospitals in Singapore. Whereas the other hospitals, they have some greenery, but I think not, not so much in a big way because I think they're probably quite conscious about the maintenance budget and things like that, right? But if you put things aside, if you say that, yes, I can maintain the garden, it is actually a, 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 a good thing to do. Because can you imagine if you go to a resort hotel and you didn't have any landscape, didn't have any garden, right? That would be quite a miserable place, right? 
Thank you, sir. Additional to that, I've been part of the Woodland Hospital Clinic, I mean, Woodland Hospital, which is uh, created by SA Architects. Uh, yeah, we have uh, lots of uh, greenery yeah. stuff there. Yeah. So yeah. I, I look forward to seeing that hospital because I, I know the architect, Michael, is my good friend. And he, okay. you know, I've seen his ideas and they're trying to bring in the, the nature reserve that they are built in next to and all this. So I think, yeah, that, that, that's, a, that, that's the way to go, I think. Yeah, so perhaps maybe they'll be more green than, than my Yishun uh, Community Hospital. And I congratulate yeah. them. Thank you, sir. And uh, my project also was the uh, Katib Polyclinic somewhere in Katib, but that one is another company. So yeah, they're also building some uh, greeneries in their roof decks for the for the old persons going there to rejuvenate and uh, get the sunlight. Yeah. Okay. For our fourth question, can you say that the development of the YCH is the co-creation process with the community at large. What has been the biggest learning or insight in the process of developing the building that others developers can learn from? Uh, from YCH, yes, it's definitely a, a co-creation thing because I think uh, the vision really came from the CEO, Mr. Liang. So he is somebody who is very much uh, community-minded. Uh, and he loves landscape and greenery and all this. So pretty much right from day one, um, we engage the community around it. You know, so like like I told you, every month I had to give a briefing to the community. In fact, at the start of it, before even we started, we had to have this briefing to tell the community, okay, look, we're going to have this hospital here. This is what it's going to look like. This is how long it's going to take, right? And we try to to make it as painless as possible for everybody. So as we went along every month, we updated that and they could see that the hospital was, was coming up and being built. Uh, and finally, when we finished it, I think uh, nobody had any complaints. Everybody was very happy, uh, although they, they suffered a bit of inconvenience for, for 24 months. Um, the other thing also is that um, now in Singapore, for certain um, key projects, huh, it is not just about a voluntary and stakeholder engagement. Um, if you are in a, a, a very sensitive neighborhood, like for instance, this new project that I'm doing, the redevelopment of Mount Alvernia Hospital. If you know Mount Alvernia Hospital is, is very much nestled in the Thompson and the McRitchie area, which is a nature reserve and the reservoir where we, we get our drinking water from. And next to it is a, it's quite a high-end condominium. So this was one of the projects which is considered a community sensitive and is by law, is by decree that the, 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 the URA, the Urban Redevelopment Authority, has actually asked us that we, are, we must go and get engagement with the community. And not only that, we have to get a clearance from the advisor to the community to say that, yes, they do not have objection to the hospital being built. So this is something which is new, which, which has come in like maybe two years, right? So you will find that uh, for those who are working in our industry, um, you're building in within uh, close communities, you will have to get their expressed approval. So again, this, this come, hops back to the point that I mentioned that uh, in Singapore, you have to be very careful about how you build and what you build, and what's the final result, right? So it's no longer just about maximizing your profit. I think you, you've got to demonstrate that at the end of the day, after the building has been completed, everybody benefits from it, not only just the developer, but the neighborhood as well. Right. Uh, of course, the extreme case is what is happening in Sihanoukville, right? If you know Cambodia, there's this. There was an old sleepy port called Sihanoukville, and then now the Chinese are coming in and they're building the casinos and all this. And I think it's a. Uh, if you ask me, it's cultural genocide. What's happening down there? Uh, yeah. So that you know, if you don't have this kind of control, this is what can happen. That you can leave it to the developers, huh? and insensitive architects, you can actually wreck the whole environment and wreck the whole culture as well. So this is something which uh, we very much like to avoid. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I agree to that, that we're not just building for profit, but we're also building for the, for the quality and for the people who will benefit from the building that we're building as architects. So I agree to that, sir. Thank you, sir. For our... Uh, uh, fifth question from our attendees. As Singapore and other cities are facing aging populations, 
our buildings being designed to accommodate people with dementia, for example, or those in weak bones. Some private houses are now including lifts in their own house, houses. Yeah, so dementia is something which is, um, I think we are, we are still, we are getting ourselves ready in Singapore to, to uh, develop. Uh, there have been a few uh, tenders from the government asking interested develop, developers to, to build uh, what we call um, elders, elder settlements, uh, settlements for older retired people. And yes, so the, the idea about the dementia is that, um, you know, if you study it, uh, the, the dementia specialist will tell you that you, they want familiar surroundings. Surroundings that are calm and familiar. And the idea of the circuit is very important because as you know, if you're a dementia person, you can walk, 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 and you can actually come out of your, your community and get lost, you know. So when you design, for example, the dementia com uh, compound, it has to be kind of circuit that brings them so that no matter what they go, no matter where they go, they will come up, come back to their, to their space. So it's a loop and circuit. That's one of the ideas, right? Uh, and yes, uh, I think, yes, you have to have uh, 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 disabled friendly toilets, railings, what you call the whole idea of universal design access. Now. Not only just for the old people, but uh, also for the, for the disabled people, uh, the blind, the deaf, uh, expected mothers and families, right? So these are things which are coming into play very much in Singapore uh, and they encourage it because uh, they have this thing called a Universal Design Award. So you can actually, if, if, you're, if, you, if you feel that your building is really up to standard to, to receive this Universal Design Award, you can actually uh, go in for it and make sure that you have all your, your facilities. So that, that is, uh, yeah. So for the aging population coming on, I think that would be the... the the, the, the new normal soon, right? So you will find also that, uh, of course, for the wealthier people, those who live in uh, terrace houses or, or landed houses, uh, our landed houses, some, some of them can go up to four stories, right? So installing a lift in your house is, is something which I think is coming to be a mainstream really, right? Uh, and once there's a demand, of course, we know once there's a demand, the product will just get cheaper and cheaper. Yeah, so these are some of the initiatives which I think uh, we have begun to see um, to cater for elderly people and people with dementia in buildings and built environment. Yeah, me as a designer, we admire Singapore for uh, sustaining all the the universal design intended for the healthcare, for the disabled, even the blind. As we can see on the MRT, even the LRT, they have lips and then they have all those uh, sign signages for those who have uh, impair, impairs in their body or those who cannot uh, walk by themselves. So I hope the Philippines also would have this one because still having problems in buildings back in our country. So yeah. For our sixth question, I understand that you have been to the Philippines as well. Which buildings over there have impressed you and why? <laughs> Uh, okay, I, I, I don't say I've traveled the Philippines uh, extensively, but one of the nicer buildings that I like, you have this shopping center called the Green Belt, the Green Mile, is it? Is that correct? Yeah, so I, I think that that, that is a, 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 a real success because uh, when you walk through that shopping center, you don't really feel that you're in a shopping center. It's almost like, like walking through a park, you know, and uh, that is one of my, my, my favorite areas. Uh, that I, I think uh, is very commendable. Um, I, I was there like probably about 10 years ago. I visited there and I was very, very much impressed by it, right? So you have, a, you have of course, all your high-end branded goods and all this. And then, and then of course, you, we know that you are a Christian country. And I, I believe there's also a, a chapel, right? Right in the middle of the at that shopping center, which is, which is fantastic, right? Yeah. Thank you, sir. Um... Unfortunately, I was not part of the Greenville project, but I'm part of the, I, I mean, uh, Glorietta 5, which is uh, also the architect of the Greenville 5. Yeah, just sharing. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I, have a, I'm, I have a personal question. Uh, from me, what is the future of the built environment and how can places encourage and support sustainable lifestyle in terms of both efficiency and well-being? Sorry, can you repeat the last part again? For my personal question, sir, 
what is the future of the built environment and how can places encourage and support sustainable lifestyles in terms of both efficiency and well-being? I think what's going to happen, uh, um, you will see that uh, this work from home thing is going to be the normal. Right? Because why? Especially in places where office rental is very expensive. You know? right? Because like a place like Singapore, uh, um, there are two things that drive business costs. Your rental and the salaries. right? So of course, salaries is something which is supply and demand. But office rental, right? So a lot of uh, office owners are beginning to see that, hey, you know, if I can have my workers out there at home, um, then I don't have to rent so, so much of office space, right? So I think in future, <laughs> in future, I think you will see that there will be a lot of uh, renovation works in, in, um, in the offices to make them smaller. And probably the, the demand for office space will come down as well, right? But and the converse, then people will say that the idea of the home office will now become very important. So the new apartments, maybe you need to have a special area, four to five meters next to your living room. So this is your dedicated home office, right? So all these kind of changes are coming in caused by the, by the pandemic. Of course, the future of the built, built environment, the thing about being, being very energy uh, efficient, consuming little resources and being nuisance free, that one will stay, right? Yeah, because it has to do with, with sustainability, right? Because we all know the, the global warming and all this kind of thing coming in. So how, how do we address this? And the idea is to uh, 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 be more sustainable in the way you design your buildings. So there will also be a lot of technology where you have um, new building products coming up, which use very little energy to form. And at the same time, um, uh, what do you call that? Um, they, are, they, are, they are recyclable and they're not polluting. Now, yesterday, just on BBC, I was watching this documentary where instead of plastics, uh, you know, plastics is one of the major pollutants right in the oceans. Uh, these scientists are using peas, you know, green peas to develop a kind of a biodegradable plastic. They're just as tough as plastic, but when you, they degrade after a few days, they become totally natural and the fish and the creatures of the, of the sea can eat them. Okay, so this kind of, um, I think there's a lot of, of impetus, a lot of drive towards achieving this kind of what we call uh, uh, environmental friendly built environment, uh, built, built materials. Yeah, so anything to do with saving the environment, right? Anything to do with using as little energy as possible, right? Uh, again, this is the fixed wave technology, right? And, and supported by computing power, you see? <clears throat> so computing power will drive that kind of technology to research into healthcare, better cure, um, better buildings environment for, for old people, for the families, right? And consuming as little energy as possible. In other words, the drive towards wellness in the whole built environment will be the next driving factor towards the economy. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for that answer. Appreciate that much. So I turn back to. I mean, I just summarize that when we, I mean, when we build things, we think of their purpose, a certain operational or functional requirements, wheels being built in line with industry standards, and amidst this global pandemic, our buildings plays an even greater role in promoting public health. Indeed, the built environment has a huge role to play in building a healthier and a more sustainable world. And as we look towards sustainable built environment, harmonizing health, energy, efficiency, and resilience, we will deliver stronger organizations and healthier um, communities as well as better buildings. And uh, with physical and social environments, we have a greater impact on our state of health and our lifestyle and behaviors. Um, this makes it all more, more all more clear that climate change is a human health issue and in many ways from the human health issue uh, disasters that are coming from severe to changes in agricultural output and the related water crisis uh, the second wave of sustainability we're seeing and now we are focusing on a uh, human performance i must build on top of the first and the focus primarily on building performance 
So the solutions for health and energy efficiency for resilience are the equity we need to be mutual exclusive. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good summation. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you very much, um, both to um, Theodore and to Mark. Um, that has been um, that has been a very impressive um, presentation. A lot of things were learned. Um, <laughs> uh, hospitals are like hotels now in Singapore. And then we've got you mentioned about floating and uh, underground communities. I'm beginning. Uh, that reminded me of Waterworld, <laughs> the movie. But that's a totally different movie altogether. But um, we, the, the, the future looks exciting. Um, I think um, architects have a big role to play in, in the future houses, future buildings that we will see. Um, and of course, climate change, climate environment are big, big part of the whole designs that we will see in the future. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. And before we end this, we just have a closing remarks from Christy. Um, Christy, please. Oh, yes, I'm back. <laughs> so I, I will wear a different uh, hat. Thank you, Mini. <laughs> so we have to say thank you for the people who work behind uh, this uh, webinar. Maraming maraming salamat. Uh, thank you very much, uh, architect Theodore Chan. That was very insightful, really. Um, I'm an applied math major, but this is really an insightful uh, conversation. But you have to visit the Philippines when we can fly, and you have to see the BGC. Uh, it's, it's something that is a... Uh, 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 we can be proud of also. And the Singapore Embassy is located at BGC for your information. <laughs> so it's the new uh, business uh, area in the Philippines. Of course, thank you, Mark Lester Balignota. I have to say that correctly. Uh, the current president of the United Architects of the Philippines in Singapore. Maraming maraming salamat. And of course, the whole UAP, I saw them here. Maraming maraming salamat for your support and for helping us to invite uh, participants both in the Zoom and in the Facebook Live. And of course, our usual um, partners. Uh, we have the FLPH, uh, Richard and <laughs> Rex, maraming salamat. And then BNG, I saw you, Lilia, in the Facebook Live. And then Faust is there, CDE is there, FAST are there also, maraming salamat. And of course, I want to say thank you and uh, hello to our officers in the head office for Philippine National Bank. I saw you there at the Facebook Live. And of course, I have to say thank you, Philippine National Bank, your Filipino bank in Singapore. Back to you, Mini. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I hope that has been a very pleasant uh, experience for everyone, learning a lot of new things. Um, architecture is an entirely different world. Um, and we rely so much on how they design things to make our lives better. So thank you so much to Theodore our, and, um, and Mark, both our architects and to all the architects in the world. Thank you so much. Please don't get tired designing things for our future and for the environment. Thank you. So, um, so PBSS is at Bayanihan Center, 43 Pasir Panjang Road. You can email us at bayanihancenter at singnet.com.sg. You can see that on slide and the telephone number is 6474-3700. Please like our Facebook page. Like it, please, and follow us on Instagram. And also, please support us at giving.sg slash PBSS. For any donation, any donation is welcome. Thank you all again very much. Thank you all. Uh, I repeat, thank you to all the people behind the scene. Our ladies, Cecil and Mindy, sorry for the earlier technical issues. We are all learning. We are all learning and we're all learning. Um, so thank you so much for all the patience as well. And um, thank you for joining us. 
the next webinar will be another exciting topic. It's go. It's going to be about social media etiquette. So uh, very, very relevant in our current days. We just rely on social media. So please join us on Thursday, October 8th. And our guest speaker is someone from Facebook, Public Policy Manager, Mr. Christopher Kuzhapili. Kuz I hope I said that correctly, but he's, uh, he's from Facebook. So please join us October 8th. And um, so yes, till the next webinar, this is Mini Lau together with the board and staff of Philippine Bainihan Society Singapore. We say thank you for joining us tonight till the next webinar. Keep safe, good night and God bless. Thank you.